This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Welcome to Self Caregiving Strategies, a limited series podcast co hosted by me, Allison Banshee, and me, Teresa Wilbanks. And we invite you to join us bi weekly as we visit and discuss one of the self caregiving strategies each episode. In this episode, we're going to talk about strategy number seven accepting alternatives. Now, here's Teresa to get us started. So much of our caregiving experience feels out of our control. Consistently feeling out of control is stressful. The conflicts that accompany caring for an aging parent can be unsettling. It may feel like we've been plopped back into the nest and our inner child has emerged to go into battle. The subject of the disagreement may seem minor, such as differing opinions about how to use the microwave, or major, such as about driving or medication management. Our next strategy, accepting alternatives, will help us reimagine control and can help us navigate conflicts, minimize stress, and maintain relationships. Ironically, accepting alternative or different paths keeps us focused on the common destination so that we're all steering together in our intended direction, paddling in sync toward our shared destination. By looking ahead and focusing on the destination, we can align our actions with our values. At times, we may resist going with the flow. Resisting the current, paddling upstream is exhausting. With awareness, we might find that our ego or our fear is at the root of the resistance that caused us to step out of the flow, ultimately causing stress. The reality is that the tighter we hold on to outcomes, the more control we relinquish. Accepting alternatives and going with the flow is key to reimagining and regaining control because when we calculate the cost of winning versus the cost of losing in the big picture, we begin to see when winning is losing. We may be convinced that we are right, and we may be right, but does it matter if our being right causes a conflict that results in one more chip in the relationship? We might win by making our point, but again, at what cost? It's important to consider the objectives of our caregiving journey. What is our goal? For our family members to experience peace and feel supported? For us as caregivers to come through the experience healthy and whole? Stephen Covey's second habit of highly effective people is to begin with the end in mind. In the moment, you can ask yourself, does winning this battle help you achieve your objectives or does it derail your momentum? But it's understandable. We resist because we care. In the heat of the moment, it may not feel like resistance, and we may not recognize the significance of insisting on our way of proceeding. We can be confounded by what appears to be a lack of logic when our family member insists on getting on a six-foot ladder to Velcro a painting to the ceiling. That happened. And I'm not saying that we should let it happen twice. But look at the motivation behind the behavior, and rather than make a big deal about it, Resolve the safety concern in a way that allows your family member to maintain his or her dignity. A what were you thinking approach, and yes, you absolutely have the right to those thoughts and to that reaction. But is it really going to serve you at the end of the day to react strongly? Awareness helps us identify the fear that is driving our response. And then when our reaction is met with resistance, our ego joins the conversation. Fear, ego, and anger are bedfellows. When fear and ego join the conversation, 
Our choice of words, specifically verbs, may not contribute to a productive conversation. But how do we let go? And when we acknowledge that we're all on a journey to a common destination, end of life, and we're helping our family member who's further along on that journey, we can use this perspective to determine our overall objectives so that we keep the big picture in mind. With the big picture in mind, we can assess our actions and interactions and ask, does this lead to our overall objectives? Our new role, which is not a parenting role, requires a new perspective including understanding when winning is losing. I want to introduce the concept of dignity of risk. It is a concept that everyone is entitled to make choices that involve risk. While I would do what I could to make sure a six-foot ladder was no longer accessible, I would also help dad try to reach his goal of jumping out of a plane for his 94th birthday, even if it went against all of my protective instincts. Our family members' motives are inspired by dignity and independence and a desire for control. Our motives are inspired by protection and fear for their safety. If we can replace our resistance with curiosity, we can begin to uncover what drives the desires. And since we can't be angry and curious at the same time, fear and ego are removed from the conversation. We can begin to choose our words and our verbs more carefully. The verbs that give control back to our family member can help us reach agreement. Verbs such as manage, control, and choose can be triggering when used in the wrong way and empowering when used in a way that shows you understand and empathize with your family member. Let your loved one know that they are still in control, managing their affairs, and making choices that direct their life. You may be there guiding the efforts, but it is their right and need to be in control. Caring for a family member is challenging. It's easy to get caught up in the conflict and feel like we're in a competition with a winner and a loser. We can all win when we play the game with intention and compassion. When we accept that our care recipient is an adult, free to make his or her own decisions, we deflate the built-up pressure and the stress from the conflicts. We can also accept that certain decisions may produce consequences that impact the whole family. And no, at that point, we will deal with that new reality. While I embraced the role, I knew that much needed to change to sustain my ability to provide care. I analyzed what wasn't working and realized that the frequent battles ranging from mini to epic were happening because of my reactions and my resistance to dad's will. When I saw more clearly that winning an argument was losing our relationship, I reframed the situation by letting go of expectations and perceived control over outcomes. Let's explore how accepting alternatives can help us reimagine control. Thanks, Teresa. That was a great overview of discovering the power of accepting alternatives. Strategy number seven of the Self-Care Giving Strategies podcast. Now, before we get started with this episode's discussion, here's an important message from this episode's sponsor, Geriatrics. Geriatrics is your personal pharmacist-led consulting service. As your advocate alongside your medical provider, we create the best possible care plan for you and your loved ones while empowering you with health education and invaluable resources. We pride ourselves on using the power of deep prescribing and genetic testing to safely remove harmful medications from over-medicated older patients. For more information on our services, visit geriatrics.org. As Geriatrics wants to be there for you as an immediate resource for when those pressing pharmaceutical needs arise, providing cost-effective geriatric pharmacy solutions. Thank you, Geriatrics, for that important message for our listeners. Now here's Teresa to get us started with our discussion. Thanks, Allison. Let's start with a quote from Don Lancaster. He said, by far the best way to prevent a tug of war is not to pick up your end of the rope. (laughs) Love it. Oh, that's great. (laughs) And whenever I see or say that quote, I think of this image that I've used in blog posts and such that 
two puppies holding on to a rope and just in a tug of war. And that's what comes to mind. So yeah, don't pick up your end of the rope. Because after learning to accept and reframe conflict, I asked myself whenever I'd enter into a situation where I could uh, really just imagine that in the past, this is where conflict would have happened. And I'd ask myself, am I willing to die on whatever hill this battle was going to be fought on that day? So these micro acts of acceptance um, finally led to this breakthrough that won the war. And, you know, every time life had presented a challenge that I had treated like a competition with a winner and a loser, I realized that, you know, we all won when I fulfilled my role with intention and compassion. And this required that I define my intention and goal so that I stayed focused on the ultimate objective. So my goal was to have a meaningful journey. And when I accepted that we are on this end of life journey together, I could begin with the end in mind. Hmm. And then differing paths to common objectives no longer seemed like battles. We were on the same team and we were working toward the same outcome. Yeah. Beginning with the end in mind is awesome. Mm -hmm. It gives you a goal. It gives you the purpose. It gives you the structure you need to know why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. And conflicts happen because we care. When we realize that, you know, independence and dignity versus safety is at the root of so many of our conflicts, empathy can help us recognize the many losses our family member has already experienced. So losses that include not only people, but abilities and passions. You know, when dad had to give up driving because he no longer had a valid license, he wasn't willing to give up driving. So this became a real source of conflict, and I called it an epic battle. <laughs> But when I was able to look at it from his point of view and take into account all the losses he'd experienced, I was able to manage my part of the discussion in a different way. And I was able to let go some of my motivation to control the outcome. Now, the outcome needed to stay the same. He was not going to be able to drive, but I really managed my part of that conversation differently and recognized that this was, you know, not just him giving up his independence, but his dignity. And that made all the difference. Yeah, giving up his dignity or just challenging his dignity. It's who he's always been. And to no longer be able to be that independent person with a driver's license. And it's a huge challenge that many folks have to overcome. And some willingly give up their driver's license and some they fight it. So that conflict is very real. Like you experienced it. It is. It is. This was a tough one. And I would just want to throw out a bit of advice for anyone facing that um, now or thinking about it for the future. Just find your alternative transportation options earlier rather than later, and even maybe start using them before they're needed. So mm. I'm just going to throw that in there. That's because... a great tip because a lot of people wonder, this is coming up. Okay, so get this in place before this comes up. Yeah, definitely. It's a yeah. little too stressful in the moment. So Yeah, yeah and you know, conflicts also happen because of ego and triggers. And it may be that you and your family member had a rewarding and validating adult relationship, but then you begin to offer advice and suggestions about their present or their future. And you no longer feel as if you're respected. I have a friend who's a doctor and she was offering advice to her dad and he wasn't interested in hearing it from her. And here she is a doctor and you know, it's his daughter. And then he hears advice from someone else and he takes it. And it's the same advice she gave him yeah. and he gives it all this validity and credit. So our egos can take a hit yeah. and, you know, we offer advice and it's rejected and we feel frustrated. It's hurtful. And for me, I had to realize, oh my gosh, I'm still seeking approval. And I knew I deserved it. I was competent and qualified to manage the care and I felt dismissed. And I really feel like it might have taken me back to feeling like I'm a child in dad's eyes. So the ego must stand down if we want to achieve like the desired result, which is a win-win outcome. This was fascinating as I was trying to figure all this out. I came across David Burns' book. He wrote Feeling Good Together, The Secret to Making Troubled Relationships Work. And he uses cognitive interpersonal therapy. He helps people get along better. 
And I was listening to his podcast and he said that in therapy settings, he found that the majority of people don't truly want to get along and the conflict served them more than harmony. So when I heard that, I thought, well, that doesn't sound right. You know, maybe the minority, but certainly not the majority. That's not possible. Um, I didn't think that it applied to me and I couldn't imagine that the majority would rather not get along than give in. And then I reflected (laughs) and I was shocked to discover I was decidedly in the camp with the majority. Really? Yeah. And this was a blow to my ego (laughs) because I always felt that I didn't insert ego into decisions. And at work, I think I was known for that. And yet that's ego, right? (laughs) So, okay. I realized that a lot of what was happening here and a lot of the conflict when I truly looked at what was happening, my ego was a big part of that. And it was a wake up call. I mean, I then had to take responsibility for this conflict that I was thinking I was, you know, the victim of. Right. So when our ego is dominating the relationship and is determined to be right, uh, the ego is the only winner. And that means there are no real winners. I need to reflect on this as well, because I think, I strive for harmony, but maybe not. Like, this is interesting. Yeah, you're making me work again, Teresa. (laughs) Yeah, I thought I was the best at balance and that harmony, like you said, this is my goal. That's my objective. But uh, reflection led me to a different place. And it's embarrassing to admit. In the moment, I was just shocked and I realized I had a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yeah. There's one thing I want to say on this. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? (laughs) Oh, that's funny. I think that's a quote from Dr. Phil. That's going to take some processing. Oh. And, you know, we talked about beginning with the end in mind. And the reason it's so important is because it does take the ego out of it. It helps us maximize meaning and minimize regret. So I want to just share the quote from Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. And it's to begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. It means to know where you're going so that you better understand where you are now. And so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. This is what helped me take the ego out of it. When I could start thinking about what are the objectives and an objective of a caregiving journey might be finding happiness in the present moment so that you maximize memories and minimize regret, as we said. Yeah. Yeah. And I often hear caregivers speak about regrets and there's no time to go back and fix things, especially as this is often at the end of life. And while they're still in the caregiving role, they may not have the luxury to think things through. It's only afterwards that they have time to really reflect. And this is why it is so important to approach caregiving with the strategy of mindfulness. And when this becomes second nature to be mindful throughout caregiving, it can help prevent or at least minimize the regrets. And that will help us maximize memories. Yes, it's so true. They're, They're both connected. And as you said, just staying focused on our overall objectives, begin with the end in mind. That's how we can do that. And mindfulness, oh, it's just plays such an important part in all of this. I mean, thinking about, you know, what are your objectives? Because they're going to vary from caregiver to caregiver and situation to situation. And you can have more than certainly one or two or three. Um, So other objectives might be that your care recipient experience peace and feel supported. Or honoring your family member's wishes to age in place for as long as possible, you know, while helping them maintain their independence and dignity. Mm. You might think about an objective as prioritizing the health and well-being of both you and your family member. And, you know, we talk about the present moment a lot and mindfulness, but finding happiness in the present moment is a very worthy objective. And that is going to do just what we've talked about, help us maximize memories and minimize regret. I would suggest that more objectives might include keeping your own life and retaining your own identity throughout the journey, staying connected to your joy and your passions and recognizing and letting go of control. That's hard, but 
we can do that by keeping the big picture in mind. And here's one that goes back to the last episode of accepting help. We need to recognize and accept help, so that can be our objective. Another objective is to find appreciation and gratitude for the experience and to have a record of the journey. So lots of objectives and ways to be mindful and think about, is this what your goal is throughout this process? Yeah, and when we focus on our goals and our objective, it can really help the conversations flow in a less combative, in a more collaborative, productive, more sustainable win-win direction. And, you know, as we've said, finding the objectives that fit for you and your circumstances is how you're going to feel passionate about them and be able to stay committed to them. And that's when they're going to work for you. All right. If your loved one isn't able to communicate verbally anymore, just focus on the goals and objectives within the situation. And you're still communicating with them, even if it's nonverbal. So just uh, keep that in mind as well, because we do want the win-win at the end. Perfect. Even as we're looking at our goals and objectives, we may need to recognize that we and our family member may be on differing paths. But walking the paths no longer feels like marches into battle. You know, like Teresa, you spoke about, is this a battle I'm willing to fight? Is this the hill I'm willing to die on? So when we realize our common objectives, we are on the same team working toward the same outcome. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, some of the circumstances that can cause the biggest conflicts are the transitions. And when we can anticipate what might be around the next bend, you know, reading the water, if we use the river analogy, it can help us understand when going with the flow and choosing to accept compromise and alternative solutions can help us navigate more skillfully through those rough patches. And when we do this, we're aligning our actions with our values. So reading the water, it's a skill we can develop. If you think about the river, when the water begins to get a little choppy, we might be soon navigating rough water. And to use a caregiver situation, if our family member starts to fall and we see repeated falls occurring, then it can be a signal that we need to adjust the home environment. Maybe adjust medication. Maybe prepare for a more serious incident. And when we see the bend in the river, if we're paddling, the quickest and smoothest way is to follow the current and go with the flow. But we may hesitate to do that, you know, follow that path. Or maybe we don't even see it because we're so overwhelmed and we're afraid. Yeah. And when you see a bend coming in the river, we can't see around it. But if we have a map, we have a little bit more information about what lurks around the bend, what direction it takes. And this applies to caregiving by being as informed as possible about available and applicable resources or the next stages in our loved one's disease process. So be as prepared as possible. And at the very least, look up and see that there is a bend in the river ahead. Yes, look up. Oh my gosh, that's so true. We are so busy focused on the immediate need that often that's why we're not you know, looking ahead and reading the water. And it's it's scary. It can be really scary to see that it looks like there's a waterfall ahead. So yeah, I think that um, that's really great advice, Allison. And, you know, we could discuss another concept, um, illusion of independence. Um, we could talk about this at length. And there are certainly pros and cons. And when I first heard this term mentioned, it was mentioned in a very negative way. I think the caregiver was resentful that you know, they were creating, helping create this illusion of independence. But, uh, you know, the more I thought about it, I feel like it's something that we can really strive to do if that helps us reimagine control and helps us achieve our overall objective. So helping our loved one maintain control is going to help them complete their journey with dignity. Mm -hmm. And it can help you reframe what control looks like. And this is important because if we're constantly battling for control, we're not focused on our overall objective. Yeah. Let's think about that for a minute. You want to say that again? That's very good. If we're constantly battling for control, we're not focused on our overall objective. Yeah. And those objectives are what we just covered. Very good. The illusion of independence. 
We're providing an environment where our loved one perceives they are the one in control by making adjustments to what we're doing. The simple example of a limited choice of what to eat for lunch, either this or that, but the important part is that they have a choice. We yeah. know they're not completely in control, but they're given the illusion that they're in control. Illusion of independence. Yes. You know, it makes me think of the many times dad said, I don't need help. And he didn't because I was doing everything for him. <laughs> it was a true statement, you know, and he was living that illusion of control. And when I stopped resisting it and I started making it part of our goal, it really reduced the stress. It really changed the dynamic incredibly. And so then the goal became illusion of independence. And like I say, Joe and I were... Yeah, well, we're actually, we're a team of three, my husband, Joe, and I, and, and dad, but we did a lot of work behind the scenes and dad had no idea what went into it. Mm -hmm. And that was by design. And that was all to create this illusion of independence. And again, I, the first time I heard it mentioned was in a very negative context, but I tried to kind of flip it and use it to our advantage. Yeah. So as we shared in the introduction, um, verbs matter. And choosing the right verbs can set the tone for the entire conversation. And I want to give an example. And this is David Soley's kind of the format he uses in his book. So how not to say it. Dad, your pillbox is a mess. Some daily pills are missing and others are added twice. It's time for me to take over your medicines. So that I can say doesn't work. Um, <laughs> it's a bit condescending, to... isn't it? Yeah, a bit condescending. And I wouldn't say that I ever said that exactly, but certainly I said something similar, like, because mm -hmm. I can remember walking in and saying, what happened here? <laughs> so how to say it? Um, Dad, I understand that mistakes are going to happen. So how can I help you, you know, so that you can continue to manage your medications? Just think about it and let me know what ideas you have. And so I did start to use these words and this tone and just the different approach, especially the stepping away and letting him think about it. And this response for me, when I saw something that um, I would normally have reacted to, it created space between what I discovered and maybe the dad had missed, you know, taking several days of medicines. And it allowed dad to maintain his dignity and he could be involved in the solution. And he would often come back and be very much okay with me taking over maybe the next step or being more involved because it was his idea and not mine. Mm -hmm. And the goal, you know, when you revisit the subject is just to listen, listen to the suggestions. And that way, even if you don't decide to go with one of those, you're seen as a collaborator rather than somebody who's trying to take control. And they might surprise you. They might come up with something that you didn't think of and you decide to go that route. So yeah, as long as, you know, you have a few ideas of your own to offer and you're kind of working through it together, then that's another way to get to win-win. Well, it's the big picture. It's like, how is he going to get through this? And if he comes up with a buy-in solution that he loves, like, great, that's going to work. And you're flexible enough to adapt as well. Yep. So... Here's a cute little experiment for you to try the next time you're offering your loved one a couple of options. Nod your head as a subtle cue when suggesting what may be your preferred choice for them and shake your head side to side for the lesser preferred option. Again, by doing this, we're providing them with the choice and the illusion of independence that we spoke about earlier. This is a great tip. Oh, I love that. And, you know, David Soley's book, How to Say It to Seniors, offers so much guidance on this topic and more. So, you know, we'll add the link to his book in the episode notes as we are both nodding. Yeah. Yeah, we are nodding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, many disagreeable, and I'll put disagreeable in quotes, uh, decisions that dad made, because that certainly was open for interpretation, but many disagreeable decisions that dad made. You know, they could have had repercussions for all of us. And this just goes with the caregiving territory. And that's something that I had to accept because I certainly resisted and resented it in the beginning. And safety versus independence can lead to the most epic battles and leave a path of destruction. That's what I was seeing. I was seeing this path of destruction that was being created. Our relationship was deteriorating. 
And I knew that it could take ages to clear. And, you know, we didn't have ages. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't know how much time we had. So I found it was better to shed the battle armor, you know, even when dad wanted to jump out of a plane. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the biggest lessons I learned in letting go of control and accepting that dad was free to make his own decisions it came in the earlier years of caregiving. So dad wanted to jump out of a plane for his 94th birthday. He brought it up almost every day. And this insistence that he had triggered my angst. And I wasn't sure how serious he was, but it really agitated me. And he knew it agitated me. And he seemed quite amused by it. So I would actively discourage him. I would deflect his attention elsewhere. But mostly I just resisted the whole idea. I mean, I thought it was, I I thought it was crazy, quite frankly. So dad brought it up with his primary care physician when we were both in the office and Dr. G said, well, why not? And so, you know, it was one of those rhetorical questions that I could have answered with a monologue. All these thoughts are racing through my mind, but in shock, I just stammered, well, yeah, why not? So I started asking myself, why not? And my response wasn't really a question. It was a way of relenting. It was a way of releasing. And my why not became what the heck was all the fuss? (laughs) So back at home, I asked dad if he wanted me to arrange the jump. And his friends and family were not happy. So they were where I had been. They had not endured the months of daily drama that I had. (laughs) So I did my best to help them catch up. And understand that this was the request of an adult with a reasonably sound mind, and we would appreciate their support. I would appreciate their support. Mm. So my brother and his daughter decided to jump with dad. That was really cool. So we met at the location. Dad's friend, Bud, came along to watch. Bud just kept whispering in my ear, this is a bad idea. This is a bad (laughs) idea. I had to swat him away like a fly. (laughs) I'm like, and I, you know, the, the, Thing is, is I still wasn't convinced it was a good idea, but I was on team dad now, and this is what we were doing. So uh, that morning, dad tried to back out, um, you know, so as we're driving there in the car, I had already had several conversations with him about how he was going to do this, even though I would not force him if in the moment he chose not to, but we were going there. And so even dad wasn't so sure at this point. And by me saying, Oh, we're doing this. I recognize was probably me still trying to wrestle for control, but that's where we were. And so we met his jump partner and the jump partner said, oh, I can land you on your feet. And I'm like, if it couldn't get any worse, like a slide in would be safer, in my (laughs) opinion. And now he's going to try to land dad on his feet. So I'm picturing the ambulance arriving, you know, with the broken leg and, and all of this. Well, then the group of instructors came. They just had jumped. They came down. They said the winds got up and no more planes can go up. It's not safe to jump right now. I think that was someone working in dad's favor, you know, up in the skies. And uh, dad was given the opportunity to either get a refund or come back another time or wait it out. And possibly if the winds die down, jump later. And he said, I'll take the refund. Yeah. So this was perfect. He was able to save face. In his mind, all that he remembered was that he couldn't jump because the winds got up. And we both learned a big lesson here. And from then on, I really did my best to support his efforts and his plans. And I think he was much more careful in asking um, for certain (laughs) things because he knew I would help him follow through. Yeah, that's cool. And you had no regrets. No regrets. Um, Absolutely no regrets. It was just the perfect situation and scenario and lessons learned and all of that. So very grateful that the wind picked up, though. (laughs) I am so grateful. Yeah, that's cool. I love that story. Maybe at 94, we'll want to jump out of planes, Teresa. I know. Well, I've already had that conversation with my niece and she wants me to. So now we're in a bit of a different situation. I think she's going to be egging me on and I'm going to be saying, I don't think so. (laughs) Not today. Yeah, not today. Yeah. And, you know, that's just an example of how not being in control can be a powerful trigger because I was thinking about all the things that could go wrong. I was thinking about like the ensuing hospitalization, Mm -hmm. how it wasn't just dad's life that would be turned upside down. It would be ours. But I was holding on so tight, you know, so tight to control. And so I had to learn that the tighter we hold on, the more control we relinquish. And 
you know, when we expose those triggers of wanting to be in control or the ego, it takes away their power. I mean, awareness really sheds light on the cause of an overreaction, unnecessary confrontation, desire to keep your dad from jumping out of a plane. Hmm. I mean, this is where awareness really came in and helped me. And sustainability is only possible when we minimize conflict and accepting and reframing our reality become firmly within our control. Yeah. I love that you said the tighter we hold on, the more control we relinquish. Because as a visual learner, I picture a hand tightly grasping onto something with a clenched fist. And in order to open the hand to receive something, you have to pry or peel away the fingers one by one to allow them to accept what they are going to accept that may be more fulfilling and helpful in the situation. Letting go to receive is a strange concept, but it's so worthwhile. Yeah, I can picture that clenched fist. Yeah, we hold so tight. And like even now, like just clenching, like mm -hmm. this is control. I don't want to let go. Yeah, absolutely. But you also brought up the point of safety and safety is huge. Like that should be our primary consideration in everything. So if it wasn't going to be safe for your dad, you certainly would have not um, allowed it to get that far. That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yes. And I think we've talked before about having, you know, ladders can be a big source of conflict between dignity and independence. And we can do things to make sure that our family members are safe. You know, we're not going to allow them to climb up on a ladder when they'll be unsafe. So I agree that awareness is going to lead us to making good decisions and try to balance that independence and dignity versus safety. And safety definitely needs to be the priority there. But they can, you know, work together real well mm -hmm. with a bit of a focus when we focus on our objectives. That's really what it's all about. And to get started with this strategy, you know, we always start with reflecting. And so think about your big picture objectives. Maybe think about the last conflict with your care recipient. Did winning that battle help you achieve your objectives or maybe did it derail your momentum, you know, towards your objectives? And then what might you have done differently to get to a win-win outcome? You know, I did a lot of reflecting and I did it not to beat myself up, but to figure out a better way forward. And I did it in my journal and I did it through thinking. And I think we have to have self-compassion. So when you're thinking about the last conflict and you're, you know, what could you have done differently? It doesn't, you know, you did your best in that moment. It's just helping you learn about yourself and learn about ways to handle things going forward so that you have a less stressful, more meaningful journey, which we talk about a lot. Yeah, that's a valid point because we don't want this to be beat yourself up moment. We want this to be self-revelation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's valid. Yeah. So in your journal, maybe begin writing out your objectives for your caregiving journey. And you know, you're not deciding on one, just write everything that comes to mind. And then you might go back and narrow it down and they might change over time. And then think about in your journal as well, this is a good place to kind of process this, uh, what ways you might be wrestling for control and what would happen if you shed the battle armor. I think this is what helped me get to that place of recognizing that my ego might be playing a part in our conflicts when I absolutely did not believe that it was before listening to that podcast. So yeah, how might you be wrestling for control? And then Imagine what would it feel like to no longer feel stress over these battles and maybe just write out some of these thoughts in your journal. What would that look like? And then, you know, I think you'll start to see when you start journaling some of this, it really will help you align the ways you might be wrestling for control and how these actions may or may not be in line with your overall objectives. And then to take that first step, the next time a conflict arises, just take a minute before reacting. And mindfulness is going to help you here. So if you've been, you know, cultivating mindfulness and awareness, when you take that minute before reacting, you can think about your journey objectives and think about the significance of this conflict and the scope of the journey. Yeah, explore why you might be reacting a certain way. Totally. Yep. I thought it was interesting, too, when you say that um, 
listening to that podcast and gaining an awareness of the ego factor and how you were in conflict because of your ego, but you didn't realize that until that moment and or until the moment where you'd actually spent some time with yourself figuring it out. Isn't that the way? Like we are hopefully providing some opportunities for folks to actually learn new realities themselves through these strategies. And I'm forever learning through these strategies and things that I may not have thought of before. I hear about them in this podcast and I go, oh, and it's all part of developing us further, helping us cope better and communicate better and respond better and to care give better. Yeah, I find it very I, helpful. I do too. And I, I do. I learned so much from podcasts and from reading. And ironically, learning that my ego was a part of the problem was quite the blow to my ego. But, you know, <laughs> in, in looking at the big picture here and the growth opportunity, I mean, that's, you know, it, after I got past the shock of it all, I recognized that, okay, this is a real opportunity for me to just be a better person and to improve the relationship with dad. I do have the power here that I didn't think I had. And um, yeah, there were so many little turning points. And this was definitely one of them, kind of recognizing my part in the conflicts that I, I, you know, I knew I had a certain part. I knew that I was trying to protect dad and keep him safe. I didn't realize that my ego was involved at all. So yeah, it was eye opening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't know what we don't know until we know it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then I guess finally, in terms of practicing, I would say keep those empowering verbs written on a cheat sheet nearby or on your hand, like when you were a kid. You remember when you were a kid and you had to record that phone number and you write it on your hand? Well, that would be a good place to have those verbs so that they're <laughs> right there in front of you when you need them. Because it takes some time to practice using the verbs that are giving control and not sounding like you're trying to take control. Those are great practice ideas. And finding the best way for a harmonious relationship and a caregiving experience may sound a little idyllic. But hearing the word conflict and living in conflict both have negative impact on our own health as well as our care recipients. So discovering the power of accepting alternatives can be a gift for both you and your care recipient. Win-win with no regrets. Yes. What a great strategy, Teresa. Thanks, yeah. for, thanks for thinking of all that and uh, presenting it so well today. Oh, thank you, Allison. And thank you for all of your amazing insights. Well, that concludes this episode of the Self-Caregiving Strategies podcast, the strategy of discovering the power of accepting alternatives. Thank you for listening today and to this episode's sponsor, Geriatrics. Thank you. If you have comments or feedback, please contact us through our landing page on the Whole Care Network. And join us next time for strategy number eight, Embrace and transform obstacles. Until then. Thanks, Teresa. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Yep. See you next time.